Hello, good evening, or good afternoon, good morning, from wherever you're listening in from. Um, the digital world has taught me, you know, when when we had just started journalism, we had to to you know follow the time, or the, the 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 time of the the time zone of the place where we were. But right now, we, you know, we don't know where I don't know where half of you guys are. Could be listening in from from another time zone. It could be. Good night from your side. Uh, so that is why I use that welcoming remark. My name is Daniel Lutaya, and uh, this is the fourth, uh, the fourth, the fourth session uh, that we are having in this series of discussions around unsafe abortions and safe abortions in Uganda. And today, um, I'm glad that I have one of um, the people that I spoke to previously, still on the same series, uh, David Lukomwa is here. Thank you very much for joining us. Um, most importantly for today is a guest who is Betty Salam, the Executive Director, Women with a Mission. Hi, Betty. Say hello to the listeners. Hello, everyone. I'm happy to be here. Uh, waiting to hear from all of you. Uh, thank you, Daniel. Right. Thank you so much. Today we'll be talking about experience sharing on sex workers in their quest for sexual and reproductive health services. Now, um, the topics that we are discussing are quite dicey for some. They because of because of the context within which we are you know we've been talking about things to do with abortion in my previous session i had comments like no abortion is a, is is illegal and abortion is a sin uh, and so on and so forth from the public and uh, therefore uh, but you know th these are uh, crucial conversations and they are don't, not meant to be comfortable that's the that's what makes them crucial they don't have to be comfortable uh, but they are fact-based discussions that we need to have as a country in order to make sure that everybody is included in uh, the development of this country. Now, um, the first thing that I want to, because I've, I've, I've done some research and sex workers are everywhere in Uganda, in every major town in the country, in every city, uh, in this Uganda, there are sex workers, and there are um, many believe that it is the oldest trade that is still existent right now, sex work. But then, just like abortion, just like teenage pregnancies, nobody in society wants to accept that there are indeed sex workers in our society. Let's start there. Betty, how would you define a sex worker? Uh, thank you so much, Daniel. Uh, like you have highlighted initially that our sex work actually has been long there even before this generation uh, we are in was born. Sex work, uh, sex work actually began when it was still in existence. When you look at the Old Testament, sex work was there because uh, when, uh, I just to quote a bit of the Bible is uh, when uh, the Israelites had gone to uh, survey a certain land. They had to uh, hide at the at the house of a sex worker. So uh, uh, sometimes we don't hear that sex work exists, but sex work is still there. And it's like you said, it's mainly uh, within uh, the, the uh, ver very busier towns, especially uh, like the Eastern route. You know, we have uh, uh, Kenya here and Sudan. So the route uh, connecting from Kenya, then right to Sudan. So there's there's a lot of things going in and out within the country. So uh, here we see uh, business people, truck drivers along this route. So mainly uh, sex work is existent and we have so many. And uh, COVID has taught us that even the adolescent girls and young people are actually enrolled in sex work to be able to uh, fulfill and uh, be able to uh, support their families. Yeah. Now, we do understand that, and I put out a tweet uh, last week and told people that s some of the women that I see um, sometimes standing on Speak Road and, and so on and so forth, 
could be engaged in sex work. And a lawyer told me that it is not a crime in this country to stand at night dressing or wearing well. If somebody dresses well and stands on the street, it doesn't mean that they're a sex worker. They could be doing their own business. And that is one of the problems that um, the uh, security operatives face when they want to prosecute because, as I understand, sex work is still not legal in Uganda. Is that still the case, Betty? What is the law with regards to sex work? Yeah, according to section 139 of the penal code, which defines who a prostitute is, but we don't want to call sex workers as prostitutes because uh, they engage in sex work, which is work. Uh, that is where they get their income. The law talks about anyone who uh, exposes themselves or puts themselves there uh, to 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 gain monetary terms uh, or money or any other material gains uh, in exchange for sex, you know. And also, if you are, uh, they, they presume you are uh, uh, disturbing the peace of, of the public, uh, dressing indecently, sometimes they uh, presume or they use the section to uh, assume that you're a sex worker. Sometimes we think uh, that only people who stand uh, on the streets are actually sex workers. Those are vulnerable sex workers, the ones we see. But we see people who actually, nowadays, uh, digital, uh, digital uh, platforms came where someone calls a client and they uh, do sex work over the phone. Or we have seen people. We have people who are in the bar. We have people who are lawyers. We have very many people. But as long as you expose yourself there for, for sex in exchange for money or material gains, we have seen uh, women who actually uh, exchange sex for to get a land title. We have seen people who exchange sex to get, uh, to get probably a, a car. So that is sex work, actually. As long as you are exchanging sex for money or material gains that's sex work what about the ones who exchange sex for 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 job promotions and the rest of things that also material gain and uh, th that may not necessarily that one may not necessarily be a sex worker but uh maybe might be vulnerable at that moment that uh, maybe she's she's need of something and this is a one-off she doesn't actually do it but there are people who actually do it that if, that is their work it's where they get incomes it's where they get um things to sustain well, what themselves about, to live. what about those who do not do it as um their main source of income but as um, as a sub a subsidy, like to subsidize their income, to increase on their income. You would find somebody, because I've interviewed uh, sex workers who work, um, who do maybe a restaurant or saloon, or they're in formal employment, and then maybe over the weekend, they, they do sex work to get to get some, some more money. Are those yeah, as, in the as, as, as long as, as long as, because, let me give you an example, like people who live abroad, they do different works. Uh, someone is cleaning uh, someone's house or taking care of the baby, but they are getting income from there. It may be a side business, but you're getting income. It is part of your work. It's part of your employment. You, you've included it as part of uh, where you get your income. Then that that is a, it's part of your work, meaning you're still a sex worker, however much you're having other side businesses you're working on. Yeah. Uh, let's talk about uh men versus women is it just women that are into sex work in your experience um, are there men uh, who are also actually we have so many male sex workers and nowadays i've, I've been interacting with some young men actually uh, 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 during uh, last uh, last weekend and uh, you see young men most of them are un unemployed and they're like you know what I think uh, we are tired of looking for jobs. And these are real, real life experiences. People talking to me, they were young men and say, saying, you know, now the only solution is to uh, wait for these uh, women who have their money and we can be able to uh, get money from them. So what does it mean that we have so many men and especially the young men who most of them are jobless and they're looking at sex work to get their income? 
because they have failed, they have looked, they have been on the streets over uh, five to three years to nine years and they're not getting money. So the only way and where to turn is only to, uh, to uh, do sex work for uh, to be able to support their families. Yeah. So All men right. are there yeah. actually. Okay. Uh, now, um, we've now met the, the uh, I think everybody on the space now understands that sex work is not just, um, it's not people who you find, uh, you know, at the hot spots for sex work in the country. Uh, there are those that will be doing it as a side hustle or that sort of thing. Now, in your experience, Betty, what has been the case? How? What is the case uh, like for these sex workers? Would they try to access sexual and reproductive health services? Is there a difference, or um, do they just walk in and get the services as any normal person would do? And um, and are they are they treated as as uh, equal to people who are in other lines of business? Yeah, uh, I want to start by saying that uh, when we see people on the street or sex workers on the street, we think they are the only sex workers. But these are the most uh, vulnerable sex workers. And, uh, you know, these are people who can't uh, work in uh, a private clinic and uh, access uh, services because they don't have money. The only money they have probably is uh, to support their families. But uh, just back to that uh, sex worker on the street, uh, these actually face uh, stigma and discrimination uh, from the health centers. Because one, today they are going uh, for a service. Maybe they have an STI. The next week they are going. The other week they are going. So I'm so ask you, why is it you particularly are coming to, uh, to a health center to access these services almost over and over again? So. Uh, the issue is um, they face stigma and discrimination because then there, if uh, the, the health worker realizes that uh, today you're coming, the next week you're coming, then uh, there is that shame or outing they will do uh, in front of other patients. So uh, it's either they will uh, maybe tell them to go on the line, be on the list of the line. And yet, you know, these sex workers actually are, uh, the daytime they are resting and in the night they are busy. So they feel that, okay, now since we are outed or we are stigmatized, then we shall not come uh, to for the clinic. So because of that, uh, these sex workers are actually stigmatized uh, at health centers. So one, they end up not uh, going for the services uh, because they will, they will face the same stigma uh, at the health centers. So uh, does that stigma then translate to unsafe abortions because they cannot access uh, any yeah. safe method? Yeah, because uh, one is if they can't access uh, services, probably test for if they are uh, uh, pregnant or go for family planning methods or uh, access condoms, then they will be vulnerable uh, to get uh, pregnant because uh, these, uh, these clients, some of them... Uh, don't use condoms or they prefer not to use condoms or they prefer to um, uh, to have unprotected sex or during the sex sometimes these uh, clients prefer to break the condoms and and they forcefully force themselves on the sex worker so when they they they, are, they, they find that they are not uh, and have not accessed family planning or they the condoms has broken and there is no one to give them condoms or at the health centers they have refused to give them condoms or they actually may not have the information we had one instance where a sex worker told us that um they had they were raped by uh, a client this client they negotiated for money uh, to have protected sex then in, in the midst of the sexual intercourse these clients want unprotected sex so uh, this uh, girl immediately after sex runs to a to a shop to get um to get uh cold water to rinse to prevent herself from hiv and also pregnancy so um, what means is this uh, sex worker didn't have information because then if she had information then she would have known okay i need to take emergency pills so uh 
because of the stigma and discrimination, one, they cannot access even emergence uh, contraceptives when they are faced with this uh, unprotected sex. They cannot actually uh, even access mere condoms because at the drug, sh at the drug shops or pharmacies, these condoms are sold. Or they cannot actually access family planning because of the stigma and discrimination they face. So this causes them to actually face the unsafe abortions because even the safe abortions are expensive or they cannot e easily be accessed anywhere like a public health center because of course uh, abortion is restricted uh, within the country thank you but, but we, we, we do understand that the under the law the medical workers are meant to treat every person who walks in as a patient so what has been your experience like what, what, what is where these medical workers you know ch turning away these these women um because they are sex workers where are they not not working on them you talked about them being denied or uh, you know being denied condoms sometimes yeah you know uh, we come from uh different backgrounds, but also in terms of uh, the religious aspect and the cultural aspects. Uh, we have seen sex workers regarded as outcasts, regarded as uh, people who are demonic possessed. Uh, this, this is something that is not acceptable within uh, uh, the, com the our society. So uh, these health workers are also from within the, the communities, the societies, they have the uh, the same, they profess the same religion, uh, like uh, Christianity or Islam, where uh, sex work is not acceptable. So, uh, however much they have qualifications, uh, health uh, health workers, they and they swore an oath uh, to treat everyone equally and to um, uh, forefront the right to life. They are also from this, uh, the same cultures as we, as the. Uh, Ugandans, all Ugandans are, are from, but also the law. So these, sometimes they actually forefront uh, the religion and also the culture they come from and uh, uh, regard uh, sex work as uh, someone whom they can't work on, uh, someone who is actually spreading HIV or uh, someone who is uh, satanic. So these are perceptions that all people have, unless they have been trained and they have gone through a series of uh, uh, mentorship and uh, uh, they are trained by the ministry. That's why we have kept uh, keep population uh, focus person that we have seen health centers, even when others are trained, they will say, okay, Musao, KP focus person, your people have come. So there is that stigma still because of uh, where people come from, the culture, the religion, and also the, the law within the country that uh, sex work is still uh, criminalized. Yeah, thank you. Um, would you consider sex workers to be some of the most at risk uh, populations for unsafe abortions because of just um, uh, the, because of their 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 uh, kind of business that they are in um, in that they are having sex almost on a daily. Would you consider them most at risk? And do you think that we are doing enough as a country to make sure that they do not uh, fall into that statistic of maternal deaths with uh, due to unsafe abortions? Definitely, sex workers are. Uh, uh, let me say, among the, the uh, could say the first among uh, uh, when you include the adolescent girls, but sex workers are among because these are people who uh, have uh, ten and above uh, partners every day whom they see on the daily basis, and most of which are, are people who actually uh, forcefully force themselves, even when the sex workers are. Uh, negotiate for safer sex to use condoms uh, these men uh, or the women say okay you know what we are talking about the women the they, 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 the men say you know what we don't want condoms even when they put condoms they uh, break the condoms to ensure that they use uh, unprotected sex so sex workers among uh, 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 the categories or groups uh, which I um, actually face unsafe abortions. Let me just give uh, statistics this week. This week we have actually handled like three cases of uh, uh, sex workers we have re referred for safe abortion. You can imagine. And now, uh, just today I had 
I had in a certain hotspot, uh, one of the sex workers procured an abortion from their home. And I'm yet to ascertain whether it was a self-managed medical abortion, but I'm all, I, I presume it was not. There is that uh, plant they used to uh, to remove. And the baby, they are saying it was a five-month baby, which was actually uh, kicking. So you can imagine such a girl could have died from their room, but uh, we were able to uh, uh, trace a, a, a community peer who referred the client to a uh, Tororo uh, hospital. So, so you can imagine just within a week that uh, the cases we were receiving, uh, very many unsafe abortions among uh, other sex workers. So they are, let's say, number one people who are actually uh, at risk of unsafe abortions. And do you think that the government is doing enough, um, Minister of Health is doing enough to to make sure that um, the the sex workers are protected from from unsafe abortions, because in my experience, and this is something that I have written about extensively as a journalist, but also through the uh, the series of these spaces that I've had and talking to different people, I've found that our government is one that will deny something on paper, will deny that sex workers exist, that um, unsafe abortions are happening, that teenage pregnancies are, or that teenagers are having sex on paper, and then go around and give. Uh, you know, post-abortion care and give condoms and give all these sorts of things. And yet, if you ask them in an interview, they will say, we are for God and my country, and therefore children are not having sex and sex workers don't exist. Do you think that government is doing enough? I think the government is doing enough on other things, like, um, let's, say, let's say, HIV and uh, maybe uh, family planning and what, but there is so much lacking on issues of unsafe abortions among sex workers specifically. Uh, they, there has been uh, so much intervention by the government on HIV prevention, but not directing themselves specifically on a prevention of unsafe abortion. Because uh, if if they then did, then we sh we would have been seeing them having conversations, going to uh, different hotspots, uh, having discussions with the sex workers within the hotspots themselves, ensuring that uh, okay, we these uh, sex workers can be able to receive uh, safe abortion services, or they are able to uh, immediately refer. Uh, uh, sex workers who have procured unsafe abortion for PAC. So uh, I, in my capacity, I think uh, CSOs like they had have done much with other organizations like Women with a Mission, but not the government in this area. Probably they are focusing or redirecting their resources on uh, safe abortion for uh, adolescent girls. But in under sex work, they, there is little, little which has done, been done in terms of uh, um, uh, directing their resources on a uh, safe abortion among all pack for uh, sex workers specifically. Yeah. All right. Uh, the good thing we have a doctor here, Dr. David, uh, your profession has taken another beating for turning away sex workers from uh, medical care. Uh, Dave, uh, Dr. David was with us uh, last week in one of these sessions. Now I'm going to read some of the comments that we have from the public here. Um, um, Nachibu Kanu says, uh, Daniel, thank you so much for hosting this space. Just wondering what category of sex workers we are dealing with. Are we considering the online ones, those around hotels in rural communities? Asking because I think at each level, the need, the need for services is different. Also, what could be the rates of unsafe abortion among sex workers of the rural communities? How feasible is it to access the safe abortion services? I'm wondering what possible recommendation Miss Betty would propose to ensure services of safe legal abortion get to the sex workers. Betty, that's for you. Yeah, I think uh, the the rural uh, vulnerable sex workers, the rural sex workers are more vulnerable because uh, uh, someone who is dick door can be able to use uh, 
the phone, can be able to uh, search on internet, can be able to get information on on how and where to access a service, can be able to uh, can afford internet. But uh, the, the, the more vulnerable ones are the ones in the rural areas because these are people who don't even have smartphones. Because now days we have apps where um, you can access information on uh, safe abortion. We have SEHAD, which has an app where they, you can access all communications on uh, safe abortion. So the most vulnerable is uh, the, the female sex workers who are actually in rural areas. So I would think a recommendation could be that if organizations, uh, if there would be funding for organizations, uh, where there is one-on-one, -on -one, because now we have... Uh, um, uh, self-managed uh, medical abortion recommended by the World Health Organization that if uh, organizations have different DICs because we have organizations at grassroots levels who who actually have DICs. If only we had DICs where we can have like health workers or uh, health, uh, uh, health teams who can be able to reach out to the different, like we are doing that within um, uh, our organization. We have DIC where we, we have uh, community uh, change agents who reach out to uh, to the hotspots uh, within the communities that if they realize someone wants a safe abortion, we are able to refer them to uh, for safe abortion services. So the rural communities are more vulnerable. They cannot access information. This information on safe abortion is everywhere and uh, where to access. We have... Um, uh, the apps which are now available, we have Ubuntu, Reproductive Health uh, Advocates, uh, health workers who also have, have developed an app. We have Sehad and others who have developed an, an app. So uh, main uh, information can be got uh, anywhere, but uh, I think the vulnerable ones are the ones in, in the rural communities. Yeah. All right. Um so um anybody who wishes to ask questions please there is a button on your i think it's bottom right bottom right corner of your screen you can uh, go there and type in your question or comment uh or yeah yeah go there let me read some more um paul webbs says a new a news bite in daily monitor of august 25th 2017 stated that Kaihura gave prostitutes aka safe sex workers border border cash for spy work can sex workers be trustworthy in their business question mark betty <laughs> yes um uh, like um, like any other any other um, any other profession i i can't i can't detect on on terms of uh, in terms of uh, like confidentiality but like any other work, sex work is work, and uh, everyone goes into sex and, and, work and because. Think, and I think that's where that's where uh, the public the, the public draws the line. The debate is if sex work is actually work, and uh, m most people don't, don't believe. Like there's a comment here in in our comment section uh, where um, Inspire Trans Movement says, "Remember, in Uganda, abortion is illegal." And we we support unsafe abortion in Uganda. And then Masi Chitende says, what has the community done to educate the buyers on how to treat their service providers? So, and, and this is something that I said earlier, Betty. It, it looks like everybody here on this space, everybody in parliament that are making the laws, um, the police, acknowledge that sex work, sex work is happening. And that 2017 news bite should teach us that even the head of the police by then, if that news bite is actually a fact, uh, the head of the police acknowledged that these uh, women and men were into sex work and found actually something that he could use them for in intelligence gathering. But the only challenge yes. is when we when we tell the um, the uh, you know the uh, parliament that how about we draft laws that are meant to protect these people, especially in their access to sexual and reproductive health. That's where they draw the line and all of a sudden everybody starts uh, praying and going to church and saying they are holy and cannot accept sin. 
Yeah, Betty, Daniel, I, uh, Daniel, I just want you to recall one incident. Just, I think, last year, I can't remember the date, but it it was all around news where, where um, a parliamentarian, I think they, was in a, they were in a break, lunch break, then uh, they, they, uh, they had uh, one parliamentarian had the sex worker, so they disagreed in terms of uh, money. And uh, what he did, he was used as a security guards to beat the sex worker. And many uh, women politicians and, and also um, women human rights organization came and, and defending uh, that particular woman who was a sex worker at, at, the, at that time. So the issue is uh, sometimes we want to hide our faces within the soil and uh, try not to, uh, to, to see what is really going on. But even the, 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 the parliamentarians who sit and draft these laws are actually clients of these sex workers. This thing is happening. It is real. And even the young people, some of them have dropped out of school. Some of them are actually in school, but doing sex work. It is a reality. It is happening. Unless we stop uh, pretending and trying to shy, shy away, and some of which as some of us are clients to this, uh, the sex workers. And first, the reality that you know what? One, one, one of my adults and whom I'm regarding as a student, they're also doing sex work. So the time you see, I know that most of us on this call has a friend, has a neighbor, has a family who has, whom we have lost uh, in an unsafe abortion. But just because we don't want to, okay, sex work is, is these are people whom we don't want to listen to or we don't want to hear, but uh, unsafe abortions is happening. And the day they will tell you, you know what, a sex worker has died and you come and see it is one of uh, the person you know and you've not known that they are sex worker is when you realize, okay, yeah, sex work is happening and there's a lot of unsafe abortions. But it, uh, we just, we, uh, with, with, uh, with our Uganda, we just want to bury our heads and not speak and come out to speak about these issues which are happening within the country and recognize that, yes, this is something which is happening and sex workers are there. Let's come out and draft these laws. But we just want to decide and cover our heads uh, in the soil. All right. I'm going to ask uh, anybody who has um, a question or comment also that wants to to, to probably vocalize your question or comment. You may not be able to write, but you want to vocalize it. Please ask for the microphone so I, so that I can be able to give you the mic and you ask Betty uh, any question or give a comment on this topic. So you can ask for the microphone. Now the floor is open, but I'll continue engaging Betty. I can see more comments down here. I'm going to be reading those um, in uh, shortly so, so that uh, your comments, your questions can be answered by Betty. Now, um, We've, we've understood throughout this space that um, the, these are facts. And uh, if there's anything I've learned from hosting this series of spaces, it is that we need to have fact-based debates. And the fact is that sex workers are everywhere in Uganda. They are in the hotspots that Betty has mentioned. But there's also an issue of sex trafficking, you know. Um, whereas some may enter sex work voluntarily, others may enter sex work uh, involuntarily, I have interviewed um, some some women who say their first encounter with uh, sex work was involuntary because they were brought from their villages and told they were coming here to do work, or to do a job or something, and then put in a brothel and they had to start um, serving clients in sex work. Have you have you heard of such experiences, Betty? And and um, are those also some of the uh, the people that you've spoken to? Um, uh, are they are they those that have sought unsafe abortions? Yeah, uh, just um, uh, was it two weeks ago? We we hosted one of the sex workers uh, at uh, Jojo FM in Busia, and uh, she was speaking. And uh, how she narrates is uh, she she lost her parents and uh, she had uh, an aunt in Busia. And uh, this auntie told her, you know what, I'm going to get for a job. Please come. So when she came, she was taken somewhere. And little did she know that this person is going to uh, connect her to sex work. So she uh, began working in a bar 
then uh, of course the uh, the lady said you know what you cannot only work on it but you also have to satisfy my clients so of course there are instances where uh, people are uh, intersex work and uh, they have uh, they actually involuntary and uh, we condemn that we don't we, we feel that uh, sex work should be voluntary and not to coerce anyone to join uh, sex work with with against their consent and usually what we do is when we find such instances uh, we uh, do interventions so uh such uh, categories of people one is uh, such a person does not uh, does not have bargaining power to negotiate in terms of uh, condom use, in terms of uh, uh, like uh, whether to use or not to use a condom, or they can be easily raped by uh, clients. So most actually of those uh, who uh, get unsafe abortions are the adolescent ones, then those who are uh, involuntary. But also we find even those who have been there for a longer time, uh, a man can overpower you and they forcefully force themselves on you without a condoms. So uh, the issue is the bargaining power while you are uh, having sex uh, when you receive a client. So most of the time these uh, new people or those who have been forced into uh, 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 sex work don't have the bargaining power to bargain with a man uh, to to, uh, to use a condom so we, they find themselves uh, having sex or when um, it, during sex uh, they have negotiated that you know what we need to use a condom then the, the man intentionally slips off the condom or tears it they may not know or recognize that okay you know what a condom is off or it, it has been torn by the, the client so these actually uh, face uh, get pregnant and most of the time they uh, do unsafe abortions because one they don't even know where to access a safe abortion services all right, I'm going to invite. Uh, I'm going to invite Uncle Ed, uh, Edgar Mwaka, uh, to give his question or comment. He's requested for a microphone. Edgar, please go ahead. Yes, Daniel. Good afternoon. Uh, thank you, everybody that is online. I think this is my third time attending uh, this platform. Uh, I'm happy about the idea that you people brought up and what we are actually discussing. In 2015, I happened to work with an NGO that uh, we were implementing a particular project that uh, uh, works directly with a key population and, and sex workers. So one thing that people need to know in Uganda, they say sex work is illegal, but it is happening. There are people that need the service and the people that actually sell the service. So one of the key things that I noted, uh, that was 2015 to about to 2017, when you look at uh, the sex workers that are in the peri-urban, or call them cities or urban areas, they are more organized. These are people who, they have a leader, they have channels of reporting, and uh, basically they are very organized, and they have channels uh, through which they can uh, channel their complaints or get other services, let it be maybe uh, SRH services, or uh, park services whenever they need them. They are very organized. But when you look at the sex workers that are in rural areas, call them the villages or so, majority of them are not organized and uh, uh, majority of them are illiterate, are people who may be P7 leave, uh, senior four or some. No, basically they're, they're just there doing the business, but they're not organized. Now, those are the people that are actually in need of some of these services like the SRIs, uh, services or park services and uh, I'm happy some of them uh, work closely with the local leaders to actually access some of these services from the local health center tools or health center threes or the district health centers now one of the things that you need to know I had uh, Daniel talk about uh, some people that, that there is uh, what they call uh, sex trafficking happening uh, all I can say I would, uh, deny, I would actually refute that Today, I think sex trafficking is there, but it must be happening in the villages. In the peri-urban, majority of young people are indulging in this uh, business, either because of peer pressure or because of the poverty levels. Somebody wants to hold an iPhone 14 Max Pro, okay? 
but is unable to get money maybe from the boyfriend or something. So you find themselves indulging in this practice just because they want to make extra bucks. And they've actually seen the reality that when you indulge in this practice, you actually make more money. We've seen actually scenarios of young people sharing news for money. So that's already prostitution. So I believe and know that uh, this is happening and we should not say that. I mean, we shall say uh, sex work is illegal in Uganda, but it's something that is happening. I like the way uh, the sex workers that are Perry Urban, Perry Urban actually doing their, their, their thing. If all of them would be organized like this, I think NGOs that are actually trying to help people, the key population and sex workers, uh, try to get some of these services, would actually champion some of these projects and they will be able to reach the target population. Anyway, anyhow, thank you very much and uh, that is my contribution. Thank you. All right, thank you, Edgar. I'm going to invite Brian Akandwanaho. Brian Akandwanaho, you asked for the microphone. Please give your question or comment to Betty. Hello, Daniel. Yes, we can hear you. Hello. Brian. Yeah, okay. Hey, thank you. You always give me a chance to participate in this. Thank you very much. And thank you, Betty. Um, bank on the issue concerning with today's topic. Last time I talked about poor reproductive services offered to the people who are needy in it in our areas of facilities. And we should sympathize with these sex areas with these sex workers because they are also they are they are they are they are also looking for the living so we should not blame them. But most of the sex workers are really needy. These ladies normally approach health facilities for the betterment of their life. But after explaining everything to the responsible person at the facility, I'm shocked what happened. Do you know what happens? After explaining everything, maybe how they got pregnant, how they conceived, there is a worker normally tell them that here we don't abort. And the end result is that these areas of workers end up blaming these women. And you know everyone or everybody, when you are in a mistake, you don't need to be blamed. You need to be counseled as well. And last time someone talked about safe abortion, safe abortion, how you can get it. These things are in private, in private setting. These things are so expensive with abortion. It requires a lot of money. And these ladies, and these ladies can't raise that money for sure. So, which means that these ladies will end up carrying out the procedures of this abortion from their rooms. And the end result, they will die. And they will get oh, a, lot of, a lot of complications. So, um, this is a question that goes to, to Betty. What should be done to extend these services in the government facilities? For the betterment of for the betterment of these these people in our government in our in our in our in our country because this business of sex workers will not end. Thank you. All right, Betty, you've had those questions. Let me just give you one more so that you take all of them at once. Um, uh, Mr. Hashtag says, on September 16th, I watched Girls in Risky Business documentary on NBS TV about underage girls engaged in prostitution in Kampala's brothels. Do you have measures and regulatory umbrellas when it comes to the recruitment process of these health workers, or is, every, or is everything informal? There you go, Betty. You have uh, three questions. Betty? 
you can unmute and answer those. Yeah, thank you so much. Uh, maybe the last question wasn't clear, but uh, I want to agree that uh, with the first person that uh, yes, in uh, the urban settings, uh, the sex worker community is more organized. Uh, they actually have uh, very many organizations and they have very many peers. There is a referral network from a, a peer to the organization. They are more referred, which is different from uh, what what is happening within uh, the communities in rural areas. That uh, here, yes, there are organizations, but there are few, and uh, most of them actually don't work on sex workers. So they are actually more. They are not more organized here. What we have is people come and people go. Uh, they are on the move. Is where they their clients is where they they will go. So. Uh, they are they are not more organized like how uh, they, they, there is there are in uh, in the urban settings. Then in terms of uh, the financial constraints, like I said initially, that uh, the sex workers here or sex work uh, they, for them they they are they they do work like any other person to get money to sustain their families. But of course. Uh, People go for sex work as little in rural areas as 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 little or as low as two thousand. You can imagine that a person will come and because they want they left home and uh, uh, they, they, there is no food, they will accept, accept any other any person who will come. So they go as low as two thousand. They go as low as three thousand to be able to uh, sustain their families. So. If a safe abortion is around like 150 or 350, where will this this person get this money to be able to uh, access a safe abortion? And yet they have uh, a, a child to take to school or even money to uh, to to buy just food at home. So it is about the financial constraint uh, mainly because they can't access safe abortion services. Do they? they uh, it's when they turn to uh, these unsafe ways. Yeah. And I didn't get the last question. Maybe uh, try to share what the person said, and I could, uh, in turn, be able uh, to answer. Let me let me, let me re re repeat it. it. Says on September 16th, I watched girls. This is Mr. Hashtag. I watched Girls in Risky Business, which was a documentary on NBS TV about underage girls engaged in prostitution in Kampala's brothels. Do you have measures and regulatory umbrellas when it comes to the recruitment process of these sex workers, or is everything informal? Yeah, let me assure that person or the speaker that no one recruits anyone into sex work. Unless otherwise they have been misled and uh, they find themselves. But there is no recruitment agency that you know. Uh, like you see people being rec recruited to go to uh, maybe Saudi Arabia, but there is no agency which says, okay, we are going to recruit people in sex work. People just find themselves uh, in sex work, one, because they want to meet the standards of living, because we are all aware that the standards of living have become high. So, um, of course, because of the the issues they face, the human rights violations by the police, uh, by the clients, by their partners, by the community, and also in terms of HIV prevention, unsafe abortion mainly, uh, organizations come up and there are umbrella organizations. We have a uh, Uganda network of uh, Uganda Network for Sex Worker Led Organization called UNESCO. You have Uganda Key Population uh, Network. We have Alliance advocating for a uh, change. We have women with a mission. I mean, many organizations which come up to see how can we help uh, sex workers, uh, our fellow sex workers within the community, to be able to access services in terms of access to uh, safe abortion uh, services, access to uh, other SRHR services like family planning, uh, lubricants, condoms. So the organizations are there where uh, they, these have referral networks, they have, uh, they have. Uh, 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 community peers or peer educators who uh, uh, refer uh, the sex workers to their organizations to access if it's in terms of legal, if it's in terms of safe abortion, but there are no recruitment agencies for sex workers. Thank you. 
Now, um, there, there has, you know, I've, I've done, I've been a journalist for many years, over a decade, I've done this thing of journalism. If, um, if you want to understand um, how much um, or how much sex work goes on, you will have to go to, to the islands. I went to um, an island called Migingo in Lake Victoria. Now, I'm not sure which country that island is in, and I don't want to go into that debate, but it is in an island in Lake Victoria, which is in either Uganda or Kenya. And that island has four brothels, four. Four brothels and no hospital. That means that for the inhabitants of this uh, island, they cannot, they have, they are having sex because they have four brothels, but access to any type of healthcare is very difficult to come by and very expensive because you have to take a boat ride. These already vulnerable health uh, sex workers have to take a boat ride to either the Ugandan main mainland or the Kenyan mainland in order for them to uh, to get uh, the much needed health care. And that's where unsafe abortions come in. Um, Betty, as we close, I want you to give us your final remarks to our listeners. Uh, what do you want them, if they are to forget everything that we have spoken about in the last hour, what shouldn't they forget as you wrap up? Yes, uh, thank you, Daniel. I want to tell everyone that um, unsafe abortion is uh, one of the leading causes uh, of maternal mortality and morbidity among women, and that is inclusive of sex, sex work. We should not stop uh, talking about this conversation of uh, access to safe abortion, but also ensuring that the law is lenient enough to be able to uh, accept safe abortion. So as organizations, as our communities, many women within our communities are dying. We have, have received cases where women are dying. So until we stand out and speak about issues of uh, access to safe abortion services, then our, our mothers, our sisters, our uh, friends uh, will continue dying because whether it is touching a sex worker, a sex worker is a woman. So even if it, it's not about a sex worker, it's about every woman. How can we be able to ensure that there is access to uh, safe abortion services for every woman, every girl? So thank you so much, Daniel. All right, thank you very much, Betty. Betty Barisalamu is the Executive Director of Women with a Mission, and she's been with us for the past hour talking about um, sex workers and their quest for sexual and reproductive health services. And we're talking about unsafe abortions in this country, trying to make sure that people have safe abortions and that we save the lives of these um, most at risk populations and these women who are seeking to uh, terminate these pregnancies. Thank you very much, all the people who have been with us for the entire this entire series. It's been amazing having you. Dr. Otide has been here. Uncle Ed, uh, we've had uh, Chidabo has been here. Evelyn, thank you so much. Uh, we also had um, uh, Dr. Rukomwa earlier on. And uh, uh, Mr. Hashtag has also been here for, for a very long time. Derek Wandera, uh, Rachel, I see you. And News 24-7, thank you very much, everybody. I'd like to, in a special way, to thank and recognize Sehad, uh, which has made sure that we can have these conversations, uh, so on and so on and so forth. And we are continuing with it. This is just episode four out of nine episodes talking about safe versus unsafe abortions. I'm hoping that by the time I'm done having these spaces, um, a few of you would have changed, or some of you would have changed your minds. Um, if I can manage to, to, to change the world even by changing a few minds, that is good enough for me. Uh, but the most important thing for me is to make sure that these conversations can be had here in the open about issues that some people feel are uncomfortable. And for me as a journalist, so into the truth, I have to make sure that those uncomfortable conversations are hard, even if they're uncomfortable. 
I'd like to say good evening, good afternoon, good morning, and good night from wherever you're listening in from all over the world in your different time zones. My name is Daniel Lutaya. I'll see you again next week. Bye-bye.